Welcome to the Moss Report. And now, your host, Dr. Ralph W. Moss. This is my interview with James P. Allison, PhD, who is the uh, Director of Immunology at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. As you may know, Dr. Allison won the 2018 Nobel Prize for his discovery of immune checkpoint inhibitor drugs, specifically Yervoy. Uh, this drug has been very successful in treating melanoma and in combination with other immune checkpoint drugs like Optivo and Keytruda has really constituted a kind of revolution in the field of uh, the immune approach to cancer. I've been writing about cancer and specifically about cancer immunology for 45 years. And I started as science writer at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So that's how I, I came to know about this. And I, I don't want to make this about me, but just to give you an introduction that I wrote the first article for the general public about tumor necrosis factor. So this is how I came to know Lloyd Old and Helen Coley Knotts and all those those people. So I, I wanted to start by asking you about them and about the earlier history of immunotherapy, because it seems like in a way your work is a culmination or certainly a a new advance in terms of the the practical uh, application of immunotherapy. But you won the William B. Coley Award. I believe that your your wife also won the William B. Coley Award. And you were the, the chairman of the Scientific Board of Cancer Research Institute. And I think you and you and Lloyd Old were the actually over the years the only uh, chairman of that Board, yeah. right? So yeah. could you talk a little bit about Coley and about Helen Coley Notes and Lloyd Old, how you see that development and how that fed into, if it did, into your own work? Um, well, of course, Coley was noted for his you know, work as a surgeon, noticing that when patients got infections, you know, they tended not head and neck cancer that he did surgery on, they tended to recur less often than those who didn't. Anyway, I think that that I'm not sure that he uh, thought that that was really immune related or was just the property of some bacterial toxins because he called them toxins. And but I think that the modern view is that he probably it was it was um, properties associated with the toll-like receptor agonist that bacteria have that alert the immune system. You know that something's going on. You know the, the innate immune system. Uh, I really wasn't aware of that work until I, you know, became associated with Lloyd, uh, you know, and uh, and I I, I uh, met some of the family, but I don't, I'm not sure I ever met uh, his, his daughter. I think, but I have been associated with the Cancer Research Institute for, for many years. Was she uh, was Helen uh, still around when you became associated? No, I don't think so. At least I, I never. I know some of the other members of the family. You know, but not that. And um, uh, what about Lloyd Old? I think I heard you speak at his memorial service yes. 10 years ago. And I remember some astonishing statements that were made at that service in New York that, that Jill uh, invited me and many, many other people to, of course. Um, where do you see Lloyd Old's role in the whole, in the in the larger picture of the history of cancer immunotherapy? Well, I think that some people call him a grandfather or godfather or whatever. You know, I mean, I, he certainly uh, was involved in some of the early mouse studies. You know, actually demonstrating that there were antigens and it was possible to get tumors yeah. rejected, and you know, keeping the idea. You know, the idea that one could use it. You know, the first time that I'm aware of that the word to, that, that somebody actually proposed that the immune system could be used to, to treat cancer was, was Paul Ehrlich in 1906. You know, he, he talked about antibodies could be the magic bullet, you know, and uh, but he was thinking about antibodies to the tumor cells themselves. Uh, never really took it anywhere, but 
but the idea had been around, of course, uh, in the early, in the, in the 60s when uh, sort of the idea of immune surveillance uh, came to came to the fore and, and uh, you know, people began to think that, you know, first of all, that's why we have an immune system now, which I think is, is, is not true. I mean, I think that's demonstrably not correct. On the other hand, uh, we have an immune system and it's demonstrably true that it does, you know, uh, have anti-tumor effects or can be tricked to. I mean, I think the ultimate origin is irrelevant, you know, but, but there's plenty of Bob Schreiber, you know, his, his work recently also through, you know, Lloyd supported and through the CRI is really, you know, given that a real, a real boost. Uh, but I credit Lloyd, I first became aware of his work in the sixties and, I'd had, um, you know, I, I was not particular. I, I lost a bunch of family members to cancer when I was young. My mother when I was 10 and a couple of uncles within a few years of that and my brother and, and um, it goes on and on. And, uh, so I was interested in cancer. I was a, a biochemistry major really and was trained in biochemistry in graduate school, but I took an immunology course and, and um, just after T cells were discovered, and the professor was, was talking about them, you know, and I just got really fascinated, you know, because I said, you know, it's these cells, you know, they, they go all over your body and go through your tissues and through your blood and protect you against stuff. You know, I said, how does that work? And I went to see this professor. You know, I was, I was, this was in the about '67 or something like that, and. Uh, you know, he said, we don't have a clue. You know, I don't know. And he, he even doubted that they existed. You know, he said, I think they're just other cells. He was the antibody guy. He said, I just think that's some kind of macrophage like thing that's picked up an antibody. So he didn't eat that. But I decided at that point, that's what I really wanted to work on. And then, of course, because of my family history, I just I always thought about, you know, cancer. You know, maybe we, we could do something. And, um, and I... You know, went to the library at that time. We actually had journals, and books, and stuff. You know, <laughs> and uh, read a lot about about Lloyd's work, and then about uh, T cells and the T cell receptor. And, and um, you know, it was I uh, just decided, you know, that first of all, I wanted to unravel the secrets of T cells, and as a second part of that, you know, I figured, couldn't we? figured that out, that maybe we could do something about cancer. And to tell you the truth, I was a little skeptical of uh, a lot of the work that was going on. Um, because everybody with, with TNF and with and with Coley's toxins and with the, the tumor vaccines, what people were trying to do was alert the immune system, you know, stimulate it, give a positive signal and get it, get it to doing stuff. And, you know, that is aware of I me mean, that that stuff in, in human trials at least was was not successful none of those things really including you know you know steve rosenberg's work with t-cell growth factor you know this was known then il2 now but you know that that had a response rate of somewhere around five or six percent in melanoma which is slightly higher than the spontaneous remission like but not that much it also made people very very sick Finally, there's no evidence really that, that that it does work through T cells. I mean, there's just no direct evidence of that, ironically enough. Anyway, so, but I just, I was there and I was, you know, every now and then I do a little tumor immunology, but really I was just trying to understand how the immune system worked. And then we had autoimmunity models on one side and cancer on the other. And, so we were simultaneously in animal models trying to make autoimmunity really bad <laughs> and then try to use that. But and it was so, basically yeah. the discovery of the CTLA-4 that then led you to develop uh, ipilimumab as, yeah. as a treatment? Yeah. yeah, but before that I got interested because uh, you know, I, I, I was the first to work out the protein structure of the antigen receptor uh, in 82. And, uh, you know, then it became clear that there were initial signals needed, you know, co-stimulation. And so we showed that, you know, CD28 was that other molecule. And then 
C twenty four came along mainly because it had been cloned by another group in France. And when we cloned C D twenty eight and did homology searches, which were pretty crude back then. But anyway, the C D twenty eight showed that there was a sequence comparison showed that C twenty four was very much like C D twenty eight. And so that led me and a whole bunch of other people to start working on C twenty four. And so the first notion it was published um, by Peter Lindsley and Jeff Ledbetter and, and others was that it was another CD28 molecule. You know, it was another gas pedal. So basically, but, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, um, you I mean, what what the ipilimumab and some of these other drugs do is essentially release the emergency break on the immune system, right, yep. by getting between the cancer cell and the immune cell, to put it put it in very simple layperson's terms, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, essentially, although it's a little more complicated than that. But before we got to that, you know, I was, I had the idea that maybe the reason that, one of the reasons that two, the vaccines hadn't worked very well, and that, um, you know, a lot of other things had not worked, is that um, tumors might, you know, didn't, provide that co-stimulatory signal. You said in your Nobel Prize um, lecture that basically there have to be uh, certain dead cancer cells in yes. the system in order for these drugs to really to work. So I think what you were aiming at, if I, if I interpret it correctly, was the idea that you, you do need some other treatment, yeah. something that's going to kill the cancer cells but wouldn't like using uh, typically high dose chemotherapy or radiation therapy, wouldn't that also diminish the number of lymphocytes that are, that the person has to work with? Depends on how you do it. But yeah, I mean, that, that is one of the problems is that um, really high dose radiation, high dose chemotherapy, a lot of them you know, do obviously immunosuppress people. But on the other hand, there have been a lot of more a lot of studies recently that show that a lot of the chemotherapies don't work uh, all that well in animals that don't have immune systems. You know, in other words, that, that there is an immune component to even the chemotherapy. But what what puzzled me, you know, was why because there were all these ideas. Oh, we have cancer all the time, and the immune system exists. You know, that whole idea was that the, the immune system is designed to hit cancer, and yet. When we started working on co-stimulation, we very real quickly realized that because there's a three-cell assay that you could do, you know, where you had one cell with an antigen on it, and then another cell that didn't have antigen but had what turned out to be a B7 molecule, which binds to CD28, and you could, you know, have a T cell there, and with those signals on separate cells, sometimes you could get T cells activated, but without that second, and then dendritic cells can give all the signals. But what we did was we took the ligands for CD28, these B7 molecules, and put them into tumor cells, they got rejected immediately. So that proved to us that it wasn't lack of antigens, it was because the immune system, the, the, excuse me, the tumor cells were invisible to the immune system, those antigens were invisible to the immune system because they couldn't give that second signal. But when you tumor cells die, you know, it alerts the innate immune system, the dendritic cells come in and phagocytize the antigens from the dying tumor cells, put them on their surface in the context of those B7 molecules, and that's when the immune response starts. So would it make sense to give a dendritic cell vaccine in conjunction with the immune checkpoint inhibitors? Yeah, so you know, people did that quite a bit. And, and that, that has never worked particularly well either, I think, because what we realized, uh, you know, when CDL4 came along, is that, you know, a T cell that's just going around, it can bump into an antigen specific, you know, a T cell that would have a receptor specific for something in the tumor. Without that second signal, there's no, there's no response, you know. Um, but once you get it started through this cross priming, uh, when the T cell gets the signals, what happens is there's two parallel pathways that are turned on. When you get CD28 and T cell receptor, one of them 
is just a cascade of signals that tells the cells to start dividing really quick. So you get clonal expansion, and then you know they differentiate and start to acquire effective function. But the other thing is you turn on the CTLA-4 gene because that, that CTLA-4 is not expressed in arresting T cell. So that you turn on the CTLA-4 gene and that starts this negative process that is going to terminate the ability of CD28 to co-stimulate because you have to stop that expansion. Would you say, broadly speaking, that the phase that we're in is one in which cancer is being redefined as an as an immunological disorder? Because you said in your lecture that um, basically remissions or responses, excuse me, responses that are caused by conventional chemotherapy drugs are basically an extension of life by a, usually a few months, but don't really lead to long-term survival, right? But when you use the, immu immuno, yeah. the, the, the immune checkpoint inhibitors, or broadly speaking, immunotherapy, you're seeing something entirely different that had, had not been seen for many, Right, in many some years. patients, yeah. So you had, what? you had, you said in the, in the lecture, I think 20%, roughly 21% of the, of the patients who were on uh, the Yervoy um, or Ipilimumab were having, if they made it to three years, basically they, they were having long-term survival that there's basically no fall off. So in effect, it's it, what it, you're showing is a, practically speaking, a cure if you define cure as living with your disease or not dying of the disease, right. are those people that that twenty percent are they are they have had, they had complete responses or is there still tumor left in their visibly most, left in their system? In most of them, in fact, in all of them that I know of, uh, they, 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 there's no detectable tumor anymore. Now, that's not to say, of course, that there's not some little islands of, you know, small micro metastases of tumor somewhere. Um, and that, that, that's the problem, you know, with, with using the word cure, um, just to, depends on who's defining it, but I've given talks, um, particularly to surgeons, you know, cancer surgeons, and, uh, I was giving one one time and, this, you know, and I said, we've got patients now from a study of 5,000 patients. There have been hundreds of thousands treated now, but about three, no, four years ago, there was a retrospective analysis of 5,000 patients who had been treated. And that was the one that, where there was 10 years follow up. And that was the one that showed that a little over 20% are alive a decade later. And um, there's a woman from the phase one trial of IPI from 2001, that she got a single dose, she's still alive. She's almost 19 years out now without any more treatment, you know, without any recurrence. And so, anyway, this, this you know, surgeon stuff said, Jim, 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 you just can't use the word cure because you don't cure means there's not a single tumor cell live, you know, in the body. And we see spots on, on, on um, you know, CAT scans. So you can't say that they're too afraid. And I said, well, you know, I'm aware of many, many, many cases like that. But if you biopsy the tissue where that spot is, when it's been done, there's never any cancer in it. It's always a granuloma. It's a result, you know, it's like a crater in the battlefield, you know. It's, it's scar tissue where the fight was going on. And, so it's a, you know, it's a semantic question, but that doesn't mean there's not a few tumor cells. And I said, you know, but remember, you're treating a patient, not a CAT scan. And I feel pretty strongly about, you know, at 10 years with no recurrence and no necessity for additional treatment, giving people a break. And, you know, because if you tell them well, you, got a, you got a chronic disease and we got to keep checking because it can come back. You know, I, I, I know patients and that, that, that that's really tough on them when they keep having to go back every year and, you know, and there's this syndrome associated with, you know, this fear every year. And I think, and I know one woman, her doctors told her, don't have babies, you know, 
you should not. Of course, chemo is not an issue because with chemo you can't have children because you know all the germ cells are destroyed by the chemo, and with radiation too, depending on how it was given. But what the concern with ipilimumab was is that uh, women who get pregnant, there's a phase of the pregnancy where they're pretty strongly immunosuppressed. It's just naturally, you know, by hormones and stuff, and partially to protect the developing fetus, you know, from attack by the maternal immune system against paternally encoded genes. But anyway, and so, you know, they were worried with the first women. You know, this woman I know was, was 22 years old when she was diagnosed. She had brain mitts, liver mitts, lung mitts, she had everywhere. And, uh, you know, she was hospice bound when she got hippie. Her tumors went away, and you know that was 14 years ago. So she's one of the early people in it. But a doctor said you really should think about not having babies. And so for several years she did that, and finally after a while she just said, you know, to hell with melanoma. <laughs> I'm gonna get her down. I'm gonna have kids. I'm gonna live my life. You know, and she did. She just, you know, said I'm having kids. So she's had two kids. And, Everybody's fine. That one of them's ten now, I think, and the other one's seven or something like that. I, I saw them recently, um, which kind of begs the question. But, but but back to the thing is that the real issue. I think that we can say the word cure. I mean, I think, and not lightly, you know, because because there are people who you know relapse early on. But you know, it's about three years. But now with the combination of NSC24 with IPI plus nivolumab, a, a PD1 drug about somewhere close to 60% of patients have complete responses. Of melanoma patients. Of melanoma against late, yeah, why, stage, stage why, four melanoma. Why, does, why do the, I mean, which is astonishing, never heard before, 60% yeah. of yeah. advanced usually. And, and, the, and, and these patients, those patients have only been tracked for about five years now because that's where the trial was. But... It still is between 55 and 60 percent at five years, so it's likely that that's going to go out. But why? Well, two uh, two questions. Um, one of them is why is there such? You yourself said in your in your Nobel lecture that uh, that the responses are are very different in terms of the different kinds of cancer. You would like to extend this to everything because you as you eloquently said there the the immune system goes everywhere the immune system is the is the basic antagonist of the cancer cell and the fear and this is not chemo this is because the, these drugs don't kill cancer cells which is a concept very difficult for most people to wrap their heads around but and yet we we see so dramatically different responses to the immune checkpoint drug. So could you address that? Why, cancers, you mean. To, it, based upon the anatomical location of the cancer. Well, well, it turns out it's not. It's really not anatomical. It's what it's what caused the cancer. Melanoma is caused by ultraviolet radiation. You know, from sunburns. Um, that's pretty clear. And what's also clear is that. Um, Melanoma has a what has a really high you know mutational burden, Team B. It's called tumor mutational burden uh, relative to other cancers. Uh, you know, in the hundreds to thousands of mutations per cell. And so, and now we know from some work that we've done, and I'll, well, I shouldn't take credit for it, but Bob Schreiber largely um, in mouse models and uh, any number of people that have followed him in, into human tumors. That uh, the, the the immune system in cancer tends to be preoccupied with neoantigens, you know, that arise from mutations and peptides that can be presented by MHC. And so, you know, melanoma. If you if you have thousands of those, you're a lot more likely to have some that are going to be really good targets for the immune system. So the immune system is going after abnormal things right. in the body. The, the thing that's cool about that is is that they're also anyway melanoma responds. To monotherapy, of course, with IPI, and then also even better if we do combined therapies. The same is true 
of lung cancer, which of course is caused in large, you know, large uh, case by you know, carcinogens from smoking, as is head and neck cancer, throat cancer, bladder cancer, some kinds of stomach cancer. All of those have, again, high tumor mutational burdens, and all of those respond very well to immunotherapy. All the things that we can, we things. Identif we can identify carcinogens as having yeah. caused, right? Those are all tumors that are associated yeah. with powerful carcinogens. Repeated yeah. insult, repeated yeah. insult. Well, it, yeah, it's, it's probably with, with chemical with smoking, it's probably over a long period of time. With, uh, it's just something that's, that's of interest. It's kind of arcane, but probably sunburns, you know, you would get, a re you got a really bad sunburn. You probably got hundreds of mutations all at once, you know, and then you do it again and you get hundreds, you know, and so, and that, that can be tracked by people building phylogenetic trees from the mutations, you know, branch mutations and root mutations and all this stuff. You can construct, you know, evolutionary trees of the cancers by other mutations. But the real the real thing that's about that that's interesting is that those cancers were almost impossible to cure with with chemotherapy, and particularly the targeted agents, you know, because you can identify the driver mutations. That's what cancer biology, that's what the whole war on cancer was about. You know, making an inhibitor to BRAF, you know, which is mutated in sixty percent of melanomas. And you can you can have a drug that'll you know kill that that pathway, you know, you know, you get a mutation, it activates BRAF, turns on the whole math map kinase paper, tells that pathway, tells that cell, keep growing, keep growing, keep growing, don't stop. It's really pretty easy to inhibit that enzyme. And then the tumor cells all die, from what you can tell. This, this all started happening about eight years ago. But then it comes back. And that's because with so many mutations, there are other drivers that are there that are in a tiny fraction of the cells, or there's new suppressor genes or something. For BRAF alone, it's been shown that there are 13 ways, at least, that a tumor cell has of getting around, blocking that mutation and keeping going. You know? And that's, so they, so, you know, you cannot, because of that genomic instability and the high rate of mutations, you can't treat them by targeting those mutations one at a time. It always comes back. But because they have those mutations, they're sitting ducks for the immune system. You know, it just, you know, it's an interesting thing because that very complexity that makes them so hard to treat by conventional reasons makes them sitting ducks for immunotherapy. So you kind of flipped oncology on its head. The things yeah. that were the hardest to treat now are the things that are most effectively treated. Yeah, that's, that's the way it seems. And what, what about... The, the gut microbiome. There have been so much talk about this, and I know that the Parker Institute, with which you are affiliated, has come out with this astonishing report about the presence or absence of of microbiome or of, of a variety of probiotics, uh, if you will. Um, but it seemed to be sort of counterintuitive because what they were saying is that if you have had antibiotics um, recently, you would have a diminished immune response. But it also said they also said that if you had had if you were taking probiotics, it also yeah. would be. Can you explain that? Yeah. So that work actually was three groups that have done it. Um, um, one in Paris, one in Chicago, and the the one that the investigators working with the Parker Institute is Jennifer Wargo, who's here. And I, I've been collaborating with her for for some time on that work. Um, so it's it's very clear that you know what you just said is, is is correct. What she showed was the more diverse your microbiome is, the better these therapies work. So in other words, if you narrow it to some bacteria, so that implies there's good ones and bad ones, and so you know kinds of bacteria. So now, of course, that's what everybody's trying to do is. And the good ones make probiotics. But what happens when you give the right probiotic, what happens when you give the probiotics that are out there now is that you the, the stuff you put in very often dominates the, the microbiome 
of the people who are taking them and it becomes less diverse. And that's probably the basis of why, you know, those things are not, we knew the right bugs, but, you know, maybe, maybe you could do that. Do you but what think is there would clear, be some benefit, though, in terms of eating fermented foods in order to get a diversity of microbiomes? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, may, maybe. I mean, um, I mean, certainly, just to say it's diverse does not tell you everything. But there is something going on. When I first heard rumors about this, right after I, I moved to Houston about eight years ago, I just had a uh, technician in the lab work with our standard system, you know, mouse tumor. We used melanoma. We also used a colorectal carcinoma. But anyway, I put it in mice, and we could cure those with with our antibody that we made to CTLA-4, you know, the original antibody there. We could cure those mice. But if we just got all the mice, you know, got a bunch of mice together from Jackson Labs or wherever, randomized them, and then gave half of them antibiotics, you know, to sterilize them as best we could, one group, and then the other group didn't do anything to they were all had all been housed together, you know. and then we gave them tumors and treated with anacetyl A4. It did not work in the ones that had gotten antibiotics. I mean, we could see that in the mice. It was totally ineffective. The drug was ineffective. Yeah, and so yeah. and so subsequently, and other. I mean, we weren't the first to do that. I mean, I didn't know about it when we did it, but three or four other groups had done that as well and published it. And then people then started looking. <clears throat> at the clinic, and sure enough, people that got infections, you know, have poor outcomes generally. And so doctors are warned now, you know, don't give antibiotics unless you, unless you have to. You know, don't give them if somebody gets cold, you know, or or something like that. Just just stay away from them until, you know, of course, if somebody gets really sick, you have to give them. But. Have you heard about these these? Pilot study, the pilot study about doing fecal implants for yeah. people. What do you think about that? I mean, it's being used for autism. Now people are in Israel, I think, are experimenting with this for cancer. Yeah. It seems it's as if you can transfer the susceptibility to uh, or the sensitivity to the immune checkpoint drugs if they get an implant from a person who's already responded to one of these drugs. Do you, do you believe that or do you think that's promising? Yeah, I mean, that J Jennifer has some work like some results like that, as does uh, um, uh, Laurent Sittvogel in, in Paris. Uh, we're, we're working with Jennifer now. Uh, we share a graduate student and uh, so Jennifer's treated hundreds of patients now and, and gotten specimens from them, you know, stool specimens from them. And so where my lab comes into that work is we're, we're, we're taking our animal models and giving them those fecal transplants from the humans, you know, that responded well, and then giving them the mouse, the mouse tumors and seeing, you know, we're just getting started, so I don't know if it's going to work. But what, what we hope to do then is use, you know, I, I, I think it's going to have to have something to do with toll-like receptors or something in the, in the bacteria, not, you know, not the bacteria themselves, but some product. But we hope by doing this work in mice, we can use, you know, genetically modified mice that lack, you know, one of the pathways of toll-like receptors or whatever to really narrow it down and figure out what the mechanism is. But so, you know, we, she certainly got there. What, what I know that's already being done, and it's also being done here, is that, uh, it, it, you know, my wife's a, you already mentioned she's a GU oncologist in, in, in the GU clinic. Uh, one, one of her patients, but um, there, was, there was a woman who was, actually been several now, who, who was being treated, um, I think with the combination of, of anacetyl A4 and P1, but anyway, developed colitis, a really bad colitis. And um, so that's a fairly common adverse event associated with these drugs. And normally what happens is uh, it occurs kind of late, you know, after several treatments. Uh, and you can treat it with systemic steroids uh, and are things that block TNF 
you know, activity, uh, and and uh, still get the anti-tumor effect, you know, but cure the the uh, the uh, um, colitis, and then you win the wean the patients off of the immunosuppressive drugs, and, and they're fine, you know, they, it does come back. So it's not autoimmunity; it's just a temporarily imbalance. Undoubtedly, there's T cells involved in it, but it's not really against self antigens, most likely. But anyway, so they had a woman in the clinic here, G clinic, that they just they couldn't they couldn't touch it. They tried, you know, steroids didn't didn't stop the colitis. They tried um, some of the you know anti TNF, other stuff, just couldn't touch it. So somebody just they just did the experiment, just got fecal samples from somebody who was normal. And, and gave them to this woman. Within 48 hours, everything was fixed. She was back to normal again. And so now there's a, there's a, and there's, you know, there's been a lot of anecdotal stuff, but now there's a formal trial, you know, started to really test that. And so, I remember a study that you, or it, it, it was from MD Anderson, but I think you were senior author on it, where you analyzed responses based upon the dose of the the drug the immune checkpoint drugs that were given and in terms of survival i don't think there was much difference between the high dose and the low dose am i summarizing yes. that correctly yeah i was just i was an author that I, I didn't do much on it but 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 yeah i mean i think that we're overdosing uh, i think that we're probably overdosing patients now particularly with some stuff that we've learned, learned recently about um, the, the mechanisms of how it works, you know, using, we've been using a lot of single cell analytical techniques to look at how these drugs work. And, you know, it, I think in some cases we're over treating. So what would you think about a program where they used a lo the lowest effective dose in combination? Wouldn't it, I mean, because the toxicity of combining the anti CTLA4 drugs and the anti PD1 or PDL1 drugs, it's considerable. Or even with even the high dose of ipilimumab in yeah. the original Hodai study, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken, as many people died of the treatment, uh, or at least the combination of, of one or the other drugs that were given oh. in the treatement, yeah. as yeah. were put in uh, complete uh, remission. Yeah, some people died in the early trials. Um, because of, of ipilimumab, and, and the, re, the reason was because we never saw any adverse events in mice except some vitiligo and melanoma models here, which was expected because the T cells are attacking normal melanocyte antigens. But but uh, we never saw anything else, no weight loss, no anything. And then in monkeys too, of course, the ipilimumab, uh, we made sure that you know, it react or tested it, showed that it bound to cinemologous monkey C twenty four just as well as humans, and then gave them doses ten times, hundred times as high, and for six months straight, you know, no adverse events whatsoever. And then it goes into people, and bam, you know, there's stuff. And I think the reason is that the mice, you know, are kept absolutely as clean as we can keep them, and then monkeys tend to be. You know, even though they throw stuff around, uh, like I mean, most people have had thousands of infections, you know, and so it's easy to. And my, I think what's going on is just it's complex. And you can shift the balance after a while. Well, what um, I'm saying, what I was, but, what I was getting at was, if you give a low dose of yeah. of these drugs, don't you diminish the possibility of these severe grade three to five side effects uh, by doing that? Wouldn't that be a pathway yeah, to using yeah, them more yeah, effectively? There, yeah, but there's, there's been, at, at first, uh, Mr. Matt Squibb, you know, kept track of adverse events. For, first of all, it was lethal to some patients, but very quickly, like with any drug, the, the physicians who used it developed algorithms for treating it, so almost nobody dies of, of the colitis anymore. That was what killed people early, early on. Um, there's some new adverse events which are appearing now that you know hundreds of thousands of people have been treated. Uh, but what appears now is, is there is a correlation between adverse events and response. So in other words, 
you have an adverse event, you're more likely to have a satisfactory outcome. Now, that's not to say that you can't ameliorate that. Uh, an example of that is a study that uh, we just did. Actually, we, meaning my, my wife, actually did it. Uh, in prostate cancer, you know, this is an interesting story for several reasons. Um, one is that prostate has very, very low mutational load. Um, it's about at the level of, of uh, it's colder than pancreatic cancer, for example. Um, but yet there are responses with ipilimumab as monotherapy very early on. It went all the way to, to a phase three trial, which failed because you know there weren't enough uh, to make it really different than standard of care. But uh, uh, and then PD one was tried, and there were no responses whatsoever. Uh, to PD-1, and so BMS just shut down their whole prostate cancer program. But we talked them into, I began to have, have, have the suspicion, you know, that, you know, if you have a cold tumor, you know, no immune infiltrates, checkpoint blockers aren't going to do you any good because there's no T-cells there, you know, you've got to, um, but anyway, we began to expect, suspect, I won't go through all of it, but anyway, so we got the, the IPI might actually drive T cells in. And so we got some patients. My wife specializes in pre-surgical treatment of patients, you know, the before a patient with localized disease that are, you get a couple of doses before they go, go there to surgery. Anyway, so we had biopsies, you know, cold as it can be, look like, like I said, look like pancreatic cancer. But after a couple of doses of IPI, they look like melanoma. T cells, macrophages, it's full of. So the, the cold, hot scale, is that a measure of the number of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes that are yeah. in the cancer? So we just yeah. sit, it's sitting there, the immune system is not reacting to it. That's what you mean by cold, right? Yeah. You could have you could have cells of that very often if, if you look closely at samples, uh, you can see the tumors will have T cells around them, but not inside. Is that, respond, still, is that still go. hot? Is that considered hot? If you've got no, that's, considered cold. that's still cold, but the, the cells are not infiltrating the tumor. That's still cold. But when you right. give the the Yervoy or yeah. the ipilimumab in advance, it drives the T cells into the tumor, so it makes it more. I'm just paraphrasing what you're saying. Yeah, but it's it makes hot. it more like a a very highly mutated cancer like melanoma. Yeah, and then what happens though is what I work told us from back in the 90s is that, you know, actually something I got off the subject of, but rather than trying to turn T cells on, what I was trying to figure is how to keep them from being turned off. You know what I mean? That's a very different thing. Not only were we not treating the cancer, we weren't also we're not trying to turn T cells on. We were trying to keep them from being turned off by the normal control mechanism. So, you know, what we were doing was that made it controversial because I said, first of all, we're not even treating the cancer. And secondly, we're not trying to treat it. So people said that'll never work, but it turns out it does. But anyway, but when the T cells go in after the IP treatment into bladder, excuse me, uh, prostate cancer, and pretty sure in kidney cancer as well, uh, they also begin to express the whole PD-1 pathway at very high levels. You know, it's a compensatory thing to try to keep them in check. Uh, and so there's PD-1 and PD-L1 all over the place. And the PD-L1 is on the tumor cells. It's on a subset of macrophages. It's on the T cells themselves. So and could so, you take, I mean, since to a certain degree, people are still looking at PD-1, PD-L1 axis as an indication for whether or not um, immune checkpoint drugs would work. Could you? Yeah, that's could a big you, mistake. Big mistake. Right. I mean, so that's that's been sort of gone out the window. But if the people are still thinking in terms of PD-1 and PD-L1, you could, if I'm extrapolating correctly from what you've just said, you could pre-treat those people with Yervoy or Ipilimumab, and then they would start to express PD-1, PD-L1. You yeah. think that that so that probably, so we showed our we showed our results. Bristol Myers Squibb, and we said we want to do just what you said. Um, and people, you, you don't have to separate them. I mean, because 
without getting into a lot of detail, there's within a couple of weeks, two to three weeks, you probably you, you've gotten to that point where PD one's there, and you could do do your boy first, and then the PD one later. But then you have to get the patient to come back in and all this stuff. So you just what we did was just gave them both at the same time because they last for about three weeks or a month. So. You know, you're wasting the first few weeks with the PD-1. But Would the same they, thing happen if, with the two, the total mutational burden of the tumor? Would you, all, if you gave the ipilimumab first, would you then see an increase in the in the uh, total mutational burden? No, no, probably not, because there's nothing in here that's going to do anything to the tumor. I see. Kill. So would there be any therapeutic advantage, though, to upping the PD-1? PD Owen, would that make the make uh, nivolumab um, uh, and yeah? Uh, let's, so that, that's what we did was we gave we gave the two antibodies together again. We reached that PD one didn't work because there were no T cells in there, and PD one we know cannot drive T cells into a tumor. I mean, not even prostate cancer or kidney cancer. You know, if they're there, it's fine, but it's not going to fix it. Whereas CTLA four will. That's a fundamental difference between those two molecules. But anyway, we gave a number of patients uh, that, and, we, and there were there were several. I wasn't randomized or anything, so the numbers don't mean a lot. But but there were some complete responses where the pe- you know patients just you know, the PSAs dropped, uh, you know, with successive doses of, of, of the combination to undetectable. Uh, a lot of the metastases went away. Some of these guys are two years out now uh, with no disease. And so that led us, to, but, it, but, but the problem was it was really too toxic. And uh, the, the doses given were the same ones that had been given in the uh, melanoma trials, combination trials. The problem is, and my wife tried to, Pam tried to tell BMS, is that you know melanoma strikes people in their 30s and 40s early 50s, um, whereas prostate cancer hits old guys, you know, 60s, 70s mostly. And and if you've got metastatic disease, you're pretty sick, and they just can't tolerate what the normal thing is. And so we're doing that trial again now, except instead of giving, it, it, with two variations, one is that if he's being given six weeks instead of three weeks apart, and then also in another arm of the trial, they're getting one mg per kg instead of three mg per kg. So we're hoping, you know, that we can cut down it, but not so much that, you know. So even at one, at one, uh, just to, for our audience to explain that that's one milligram per kilogram of body weight would be like the lowest, not possible, but a very that would be considered yeah. a very low dose, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if it works yet or not, but we'll see. And and um, you also published a paper on the proposed you and I, I remember that Jeff uh, Jed Welchek was also another author on it of uh, proposing the use of Newcastle disease virus vaccine or Newcastle disease virus, let's say, um, yeah. as an adjunct to yeah, immune- so that was in my lab actually. Yeah, yeah we we did that. I was going to note. I noticed in your email you mentioned NDV, and I was going to say, yeah, we, yeah, I got a fellow that came to my lab from uh, Peter Palazzi's lab, who had, you know, was, had developed and attenuated Newcastle disease virus. Uh, Is it identical to the the veterinary Newcastle virus, or is it? I some- think it, I think this one's been attenuated more. It's actually been attenuated so that it, it, it's safe. Even for chickens, you know, it doesn't really cause disease. It's you are in humans, and so it's been in. He's been doing this. It's been in humans for years, you know, by itself. Yes. And so, and so, and so it was from this person that you got the idea of using the Newcastle. Yeah, and so so we did it, and it worked. You know, we gave. So it was, a, it was an interesting experiment. We the way we did it because the whole idea wasn't just to see if we could get. I mean, it's known that Newcastle disease virus by itself injected into a tumor well you know has pretty good uh, you know oncolytic activity and but of course what happens if you've got metastatic disease and so that was what we were at so we gave we put tumors on opposite sides of a mouse and then treated one with ndv 
you know, and not the other. And so if it was just NDV, we could cure the one that was ejected, didn't have any effect on the other one. Although if we looked at that second one, we could tell that there was a T-cell infiltration more than if you did nothing to the other one. It, you, were injecting, you were injecting the virus directly into the tumor? Yeah. I see. And then uh, we also noticed that there was a lot more CTLA-4 on the T-cells that were in the tumor after the NDV injection. So we came along and treated them with anti-CTLA-4, and then we could get the distant one rejected as well. And so, uh, and then we did additional work. It showed that if you blocked type one interferons, you lost not, you could still cure the one you injected. You could not get uh, the, the, the secondary, the untreated tumors to go away. That required both killing the first tumor and alerting the, you know, innate immune system, probably by the tumor cells themselves detecting the virus and then the TOLAC receptors signaling that think they're, they're infected with virus. And so they start making alpha and beta interferons, which then go in. So would, would you say this is in the broad category of releasing the brake with the immune checkpoint inhibitors and stepping on the gas with the, with the virus? Or the immune stimulant? I mean, aren't you in a no, way it's, it's, yeah, combining I mean, those two it's, concepts? It's an it's an in vivo uh, immunization, basically, is the way I look at it. You know, we're vaccinating them, except we're doing it by killing the tumor cells. You know, inside to in inside to immunization. So we call it. Anyway, the, the Merck Merck picked that up. Merck licensed the the idea from us. Are they going to use an just a a native? Um, Newcastle, or are they going to do a recombinant uh, form? I don't, I don't. I imagine they'll they'll do everything. I mean, we we've since that first paper, uh, we've been studying for years, both Pam and I, in different ways, uh, the role of a molecule called ICOS, which is used on cells, T cells, and so if you get a if we uh, gave a signal through ICOS uh, by putting ICOS ligand to the Newcastle the disease virus. So the idea is it goes in and uh, it doesn't integrate, but it starts replicating in the cells. And, and in the process of that kills the tumor cell, but it also makes the tumor cells start expressing ICOS ligand on their surface. So when the T cells come in, they get an additional prime, they get that other signal, which makes them much, much more effective. I only have one more question. Um, could you give me your broad vision of where you think cancer research and treatment will be in 10 years or alternately where you hope it'll be? In other words, what's your vision? You gave some of that in your Nobel Prize lecture, but I'd like to hear it more explicitly addressed yeah. by you. Well, people ask me all the time, do I think that we're going to go away with cancer. I think some cancers, maybe, with, you know, melanoma, I think we're at 60% roughly now, I think. If we keep working hard and get the right combinations, we ought to be able to get that up higher. Other ones, you know, right now we're nowhere with uh, glioblastoma or pancreatic, really. I mean, there's some hints, but I think we're going to start seeing some responses there, but it, it's going to take a lot of hard work. I think where we're going to, what's going to happen in the laboratory is that Essentially, every therapeutic regimen that patients receive in 10 years will have an immunotherapy component to it. They may still be radiation or chemo with it. I know some radiation oncologists that have uh, realized uh, Sandra de Moria is one and, and Sylvia Fomenti at, at Cornell, uh, who we worked with you know, long, way back. But they realized that they're really, they've been trying to kill the last tumor cell with the radiation. And they realized we don't have to do that because in killing the last tumor cell, we're also damaging the immune system. So what they're doing is studying how to kill enough tumor cells to get this priming, but do it in a way that doesn't kill the inflammatory cells when they come in to the thing. And, and 
Anyway, a lot of people are doing that now. Some of the work is just spectacular. You know, it's at the level now of in lung cancer in patients. You know, irradiating people that have metastatic disease, irradiating one met, and then giving you know anti-CD4 and getting systemic immunity. Um, but then what they're doing now is characterizing it because the, where the met is is important. You know, some sites are better at getting the systemic immunity than others, and Anyway, that's coming along. So, and I think the same thing's going to happen with chemo. You can reduce the, the, the amount that you give where it's not as toxic. But, but I mean, you know, germ cell cancer is cures now with chemo. But, you know, it, it does recur. But maybe if you added immunotherapy to that chemo, you know, you get better response rate and prevent recurrence. So there's a rationale for low dose chemotherapy as an adjunct to immunotherapy instead of the other way around. Exactly. The shoe is on the other foot now. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, that's the thing about now that it's finally accepted that the immune system, that immunotherapy you know, has become the fourth pillar. The unique thing about that is that immunotherapy can be combined with the other three and uh, give up, give them memory, for example, that you get when you get these cells. But, but the other thing that we've noticed, right, at least recently is, you know, the, the, the lesson that we learned from melanoma was, you know, well, the question is, why doesn't ipilimumab work more often than 20%? Well, we know now one of the answers is because there's PD-1, you know, and so you put them both together and, it, and it's better. So, there are another dozen or so, I mean, people argue about the absolute number, but of, of the checkpoints. Um, and there, you know, and again, what we realize now that the immune system has to be controlled. And there's probably more attention paid in the mechanics of the immune system to controlling it rather than getting it started. Well, aren't, so there, aren't there also antibodies to tumor necrosis factor that are blocking the activity of TNF in ter yeah. terms of killing cancer. Yeah, sometimes we have to use them to protect the patient. You know, but, like Enbrel, yeah. things like yeah. that. But yeah. but also from the point of view of the act, of course, TNF was to too toxic to actually give to people, but you could remove the blocking factors against TNF and use the per patient's own innate TNF to attack the cancer, wouldn't you say? Well, the way, well, the way that TNF was used uh, uh, for a while, anyway, was by isolated limb perfusion. You know, because they were just, you know, if somebody had metastases on their legs, you'd just, you know, isolate that and then pump the TNF through, you know, the, the, the blood vessels and stuff in, in that limb and then rinse it out. So what we did, we was a clinical fellow in my lab um, had this idea. I wasn't, I, I, let's just say I wasn't as supportive as I should have been, but she did the same thing, but with chemo, really nasty. I don't remember what it was, methotrexate or something, very high doses. And, you know, did the limb perfusion with that. And then after they rinsed it out, and gave them immediately hippie. And she had an 85% response rate. And, and uh, you know, and these are patients that had, you know, tumors all over. She was just treating the ones in one limb, one leg or the other, and everywhere they all went away. And it was because, you know, she killed all the, I think, because she just killed, massively killed the tumor cells in that limb and then released it all to go all the debris washes and goes and primes T cells everywhere in the body, you know, and then lets them loose with C play four. Uh, we, we, we got some biopsy specimens. There's just sheets of C D four T cells in the tumors. You know, it's just it's amazing. But but anyway, back to ten years from now, I think the other thing though that we're realizing is that some of these other checkpoints, I think I think that C play four and PD one are the big ones. You know, we know C play four works during the initial priming the cell very early in the functional development of a T cell, whereas PD-1 works at the end when they're terminally differentiated already and they've been working for a while and they're exhausted and it just keeps them going for a while. So, you know, and you put them together and obviously, you know, they're really powerful. 
But in our prostate experiment, for example, the patients that got uh, NRC24, we could find this other checkpoint called VISTA. Nobody knows a lot about it yet, except it's discovered by a guy named Randy Noel, and uh, there's some antibodies to it. But uh, So it was also induced in prostate cancer when we blocked C24. But we looked for it in melanoma, and it was not induced in melanoma. When we gave it. So, what we're going to have to do is individualize the treatment somewhat by looking at the distribution of these other checkpoints. They're not going to get you from zero to 50% or something, where we're pretty close to 50% now in kidney combinations. But they may help you get from 60 to 70, or, you know, whatever, as long as they don't add toxicity. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of where we are now, you know, it's really being smarter about it. A lot of biopsies. One of the things that is my pet peeve right now is you can read about there's almost 2,000 trials now of PD-1 plus antibodies plus something. And most of that's just, you know, there's no, uh, no strong rationale for doing it. It's just it. empirical. Just throw this it's together empirical. with that. Our company owns two drugs. So let's put our two drugs together. But the thing, and that's, I mean, I can't argue with that, say that's useless, but what is irritating, and this is something I learned from Lloyd uh, over the years, and, and Pam as well, and it, you know, we talk about it all the time. Lloyd, had, I don't know how well you're doing, but he had a lot of little phrases and things that, you know, were usually worth listening to, you know, he just, you know, he said, you know, if you don't learn from every patient, you're doing them a disservice and the field a disservice. And most of those almost 2,000 trials, they just look for a clinical endpoint, they don't get it, and they say that failed and move on. And that's such a waste, because if you got it, you know, you can learn from failures just like you can from successes, and if people would get biopsies from those, because we know what to look for by and large now, but you might be able to see what's, meant. you know, did anything happen that you don't get with a single? You know, and if it was, which direction to go in, and is there some way you can build on it, you know, and there's so, you know, there's just thousands of patients being wasted because we're not learning. I agree. Well, look, I took up an hour of your time and I, I told your secretary I'd only take it a half hour. So okay. I okay. greatly appreciate this. It's a great pleasure to meet you, honor to meet you. And um, I hope we can talk again sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for listening to The Moss Report. Visit our website at themossreport.com and subscribe for new episodes straight to your inbox. For your cancer treatment options and phone consultations with Dr. Moss, please visit mossreports.com.